All right. Thank you, everyone, for settling. I am so honored to introduce this session that is very near and dear to my heart. I work directly with our hosts that I'm about to introduce. So I would like to welcome Barb Reg, Sloan 2017 alum and SLOSO, who is a former CEO and co-founder of Delta V Startup and currently a founder of C and CEO of Poly Labs. Round of applause. And her counterpart, Jenny Larios Berlin, an alum and entrepreneur who recently returned to campus after having her company acquired and is now giving back to the community that has supported her development to this year's Innovation Showcase Beaver Tank. So ladies, I hand it to you. Hey, well, I have the distinguished pleasure because my co-host is so <laughs> kind to me to welcome you all first. I love the energy in this room and I love how many of you all are here. But I have to say, if you're sitting in the... Uh, I think we're good. Are we good? I think are we're we good. good. Otherwise, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to be the mommy and tell you nice to move. Clear um, stairs. But no, you, you did it great. Okay, awesome, awesome. <laughs> we're good, we're good. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have you here today. This is such a great event because it gives us an opportunity to celebrate, to celebrate you and the things that you've done, and also to celebrate here, the people in the audience, and figure out how we can continue to help each other, which is one of the things that we care and love to do at Sloan, right? So, to kick us off, where did you come from? Spain. From Spain, hey, okay. Ooh. Any other Españoles? Any other Españoles? Yeah, okay, good, good, excellent. Where did you come from? New York. New York, all right, any Woo! other? Right. Nice to see you, my friend. Where did you come? From here, from Oh, look, she didn't have to travel far. Good, I'm glad you made it. Yay for Boston, come on, all of us. And then I think I have a friend from Mexico, Sergio. Sergio, are you here? Oh, there he is. I, I, need, I, I need to um, embarrass you just a little bit because you were like, oh my goodness. Is, I, I'm, I, I, so I was joined when I was doing this trip in Mexico City um, for some training on entrepreneurship. And I was added to this MIT club. And then said he was like, hey, I'm here at the reunion. Who else is here? And I was like, I'll be here. And you need to be here at 5. So I'm glad you showed up. You're going to have a great, great show. Aren't we, Bar? Yeah. And, and what an appropriate thing to do as we wrap up the programming section of the reunion, to meet here and to celebrate and recognize entrepreneurship, especially now in a time that, if you read the news, are not as clear or certain. It's a really great time to come together and think about innovation and problem solving decomplexifying things that are really big, like climate change, like helping people connect around finding jobs, et cetera. What are we actually doing here, though, today, Jenny? What's the purpose? The humanity, the humanity, the people. The so just in case you're wondering, ChatGPT did not write my no. words. No. They're coming out of here. It's very <laughs> dynamic, very impromptu. Um, so just we're really excited to have you here because you know, I'm sure as you've been here back on campus, you're reminded about our mission. And I always love to read this every single time we do this event because that mission means something to me and I hope it means something to you every single time you come and you take a moment to look at it every single time you come back to campus and read it and ask yourself, how are you contributing to that? So, our mission, to be principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and in doing so, contribute ideas that advance management practice. How are you playing into that today? Make sure that you're celebrating that and sharing that with everybody else that's here and hopefully in the process, making new friends. And that's what we're trying to do here in this event, right? How do we celebrate our brave entrepreneurs that are gonna take the stage, some of them precede, some of them post, some of them in rapid scale, and how can you help them? How can you build them up as they're on the journey? So we will have a QR code at the end of the event so that you can take a snapshot of that and tell us who do you want to connect with based on the things that they're asking you for. And here we have a distinguished panel of judges, but it's not about judging them to bring them down. It's about how do we ask the right questions to build each other up. So with that, how is this whole thing going to work out? Sure, thanks for asking. Well, we're going to have three minutes 
pitch. Uh, we're gonna have five um, entrepreneurs here. Each of them gonna pitch for three minutes. And then we're gonna have an esteemed um, panel of judges who's gonna ask questions, make suggestions, et cetera. Um, and at the end of the event, as Jenny has mentioned, um, we're gonna have a QR code. And each of you could be able to point like, oh, this company or this uh, founder I wanna connect with, I have an idea, I wanna invest, I wanna be a customer, a partner, I wanna work for you. Anything that you want, you can be able to engage after. And what an amazing thing it is, right? Because we, you know, originally this event named is Beaver, Char uh, Beaver Tank, like the show. But we thought about it a couple of years ago when we started hosting it, we were like, Sloan is not really a tank. It's more like a lake, right? It's like this ecosystem that is connected and is feeding one another. And you can't really kill any of the animals, right? You need all of them to prosper together. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna feed the lake, we're gonna support the lake, um, and we're gonna really make it the Beaver Lake, which is, by the way, not the official name because go change an event name in the MIT ecosystem. But no, but that's what we're gonna do today. Um, and with that, I'd be really honored to introduce, wait a minute, before that, Jenny, tell us a little bit about what we're doing today at uh, the Trust Center that is really worth mentioning before we're jumping into the yes, pitching. Yes, yes. Well, so to your point of Beaver Lake and supporting the ecosystem, you know, it's not just about when you're a student, though I'm sure you have great memories about how you were supported, but also how are you being supported as an alum? Like one of the things that I want to point out about my distinguished partner here is that she just launched her Poly Labs business. Um, and she's still being supported by the ecosystem just by having connections with folks that are here and sort of saying, hey, I'm looking to hire this type of talent, or hey, I'm trying to do this social enterprise, who are other folks within the community, maybe Legatum or others that I can connect with. And so it's, it's not just what we do for you as students, but also how do we continue to stay engaged as we're alums. And so a couple of things that you might be interested in hearing about in terms of how we're helping to support entrepreneurship here on campus even further. So one of the big things that uh, we as Sloan really want to do, right, is how are we connecting to the rest of campus, right? That's probably an ongoing theme, something that you heard when you were students here. It's something that's going to keep happening. How are we expanding beyond Sloan to connect to the rest of the community and really build the entrepreneurial community? So I'd like to share two examples of some of the things that we're doing at the Trust Center. Um, so the first one is um, we have partnered with the School of Engineering to launch a uh, engineering certificate for undergrads. This fall, we had the first ever undergraduate entrepreneurship seminar, and we had our first undergraduate receive their entrepreneurship certificate. Yeah, man, this is good. This means that engineers are also thinking about the future of the things that they're developing and to have that entrepreneurial mindset because as you were saying, things are getting more complex and the more that we can leverage the entrepreneurial mindset to be flexible and anti-fragile, the better we can respond to all of the changes that we are being confronted with at a rapid scale. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I wanted to share with you is that the School of Engineering has launched a postdoc program for engineering excellence. As part of their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, they realized that they were not supporting enough DEI and women into academia. So they launched a five-year program where they are hosting a panel of 16 students to go through a two-year program. And as part of that program, they're also getting a leadership track, a communications track, and they're getting an entrepreneurship track. So that academics can start to think about, hey, I'm developing these great technologies in labs. How am I thinking about the translational science and the potential? So we are so excited to have partnered with the School of Engineering so that academics can also start to see what the impact of entrepreneurship can be in their lives. And the third thing that I wanted to share with you, which I am super, super, super excited, is as the co-lead of Delta V, we are bringing back the New York City Studio! Yes, this is a big deal, guys. Delta V is, is our biggest, uh, is MIT's premier startup accelerator. And since COVID, we have not been there. And it was only last year that we brought people back in person. And now we are reopening that studio. And so we are excited for all of those initiatives. Amazing. So with that, what's next? 
Let's introduce our uh, mentors judges for today. Uh, and it's my honor to introduce Donna, who used to be my entrepreneur in resident when I built um, Get Rid, my company here. She <laughs> is uh, an executive MBA from 2016. And today she's the CEO of the Arthur M. Blank School for Entrepreneurial Leadership at Babson College. She's a former senior lecturer in the EIR and the co-founder of the very successful care.com, which many of you probably know. Donna, come take your seat. <laughs> and second, um, someone that welcomed me on my Admit weekend as part of the Israeli Mafia. Excited to welcome Elad Chushan. Elad is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he's working on his fourth company. Uh, he's a former ABN Biv uh, senior executive, and he is an angel investor. Mr. Elad? My distinguished pleasure to bring Kevin D. Johnson, who is the founder and CEO of Johnson Media Inc., based out of Atlanta, but flies every week to come and be a senior lecturer to teach GSD. For those of you that may not know, that is Advanced Tools in Entrepreneurship, lovingly referred to as Get Shit Done, and is the best-selling author of The Entrepreneurship Mind. Kevin, come on up. And then last but certainly not least, we have Kirsten Newbold Knipp. Did I get it right? Nailed it. Yes. Woo. Okay. That was the most thing that I was worried about for this whole event. Okay, <laughs> welcome, welcome. She is an executive advisor and investor, 20 year veteran of sales and marketing leadership roles in big companies and startups. So she's seen the whole gamut. Some places she's helped build that you may have heard of, HubSpot, Big Commerce, and Full Story. Come on up. Jane, come up here. Jane, come up here. I'm so excited for Jane. <laughs> Students that I met when I first uh, came on board, and it's just been great to see your journey. Go on. Thanks, Jenny. All right. Wow. Kind of intimidating to be first. <laughs> got it. All right. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Jane Chen, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Stepwise. I wanted to start by telling you about why I came to Sloan. And it's because I was excited about the prospect of electrification. We're on this huge revolution where we're seeing an influx of EVs, heat pumps, electric stoves, all of these new electric appliances. But with, these, with this influx, we're seeing a 5x increase in demand for electricity. What about supply? Unfortunately, to meet supply, we're going to need new distribution um, grids on a utility level, we'll need new transformers on a neighborhood level, and we'll need new panels in a home level. That means hundreds and billions of dollars of investments by the government, and decades in the making. In the last 10 years, distribution capacity only increased 0.03% in the US. How is that gonna level up between supply and demand? So at Stepwise, we think that there is a way that we can leverage the existing electrical infrastructure more efficiently instead of building new ones. So by doing that, we can make this transition much more affordable. And we're going to start with the electric panel, which is often overlooked. Now, I want to introduce you to Christina and Teddy. They are new homeowners who finally saved up enough to buy a house. They recently ordered a Nissan Leaf because they wanted to save money on gas and also they decided they wanted to charge at home because they wanted the convenience and to save money on the charging process. But when they called up the electrician, he told them your panel is insufficient and you're going to need to upgrade your electric panel and it's gonna cost a whopping $8,000. This was unaffordable for Teddy and Christina. Now, you can think about your electric panel like an overloaded power strip. What happens is when you are heating or cooling your house and you're microwaving and you're cooking a meal and suddenly you want to plug in your car, well, you can overload the safe limits of that, of that electric panel pretty easily. We think that there is a better alternative, and this is where Stepwise comes in. We are a smart device that sits next to your electric panel and optimizes the energy usage of that panel. 
what it does is we can now modulate down the usage of your EV charger, allowing it to stay within the safe capacity of your panel. This allows us to more intelligently and efficiently leverage our existing infrastructure. Compared to that $8,000 upgrade, this is only $2,000 all in with the installation. So my best, my favorite part about all of this is that electricians love us. And I know because my co-founder, Ethan Brewer, is a master electrician with 10 years of experience in the trades. The typical panel replacement is about 20 hours. With Stepwise, it's only three. That means electricians can make twice as much per hour and it allows them to be four times as productive or efficient, which greatly helps and alleviates the supply um, and labor shortage that we see in the market. We've launched our beta so far in four different homes and we're collecting live data. And we have a pipeline of 15 more installations this summer before we're ready to launch live full-time this fall. And our broader vision and longer term plan is to bridge the gap between the home and the utility, as I mentioned earlier. And we're doing that by aggregating usage across the home and building a software platform where we can send real time energy usage from the home to the utility and then allowing that utility or the transformer to reduce peak in anticipation of when demand spikes will occur. This will allow us to save money for policymakers, for homeowners, for the utility, and best of all, it's great for the environment. So we're the team behind Stepwise. I mentioned that um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Stepwise. I'm also a recent grad uh, from the MBA class of 2023. <laughs> Thank you. my co-founder, Austin, who is a mechanical engineer with 10 years of experience commercializing hardware, and Ethan, who I mentioned earlier, who's a master electrician and the first Tesla certified charger installer in Rhode Island. So we are, we are um, st uh, launching our pre-seed uh, actually in a week. So any intros to strategic investors would be greatly appreciated. We're also looking to gear up manufacturing. So any intros to contract manufacturers who do small batch PCB manufacturing would be greatly appreciated as well. Thank you so much. Please stay. Congrats. Over to our judges. Kick us off. I will kick us off. Can you hear me OK? Wonderful. Great job, Jane. Thanks. I love the energy. I love the confidence. I've got two questions for you, but I want the audience to listen because I think in asking these questions, you'll be able to figure out how you might be able to help them as they move forward. So the first question is, uh, what barriers to entry or scale are there for you? Great question. Um, I mentioned on that timeline slide that we are launching pilots. And the reason we're doing these pilot deployments slowly is because we need UL certification before we can launch to be in compliance with uh, electric code. So where you know a barrier would be getting that UL certification, which requires a little bit of funding, as well as you know consultation from someone who has experience, and then it would be about finding a contract manufacturer who's willing to work with us at this stage, and then working with us to scale up our production. Great. My second and final question: Which specific marketing channels are you using, or do you plan to use once you launch? Yeah, this is where it's a little bit unique because we're actually going to market through electrician networks. Part of this is because we were built by electricians for electricians um, and electricians actually love us and are big evangelists. So we're looking to distribute through electric supply houses as well as electrician networks that do EV chargers specifically. And then after that, it would be through utility and munis in particular, um, ideally in the greater Boston area. All right, thank you. Let's give her a hand. Next up, Enrique Perez, uh, who will be presenting Skyline Sports. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, guys. Uh, can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. Let's get started. Uh, 
I'm Enrique Perez, I'm from Chile. Uh, was five years ago here. Uh, got uh, presented a company in nanotechnology, which got funding thanks to this. And uh, now, right now we're opening an office in California to conquer the US market. So that went, went well. This is the next crazy thing we're looking into. And uh, it's about taking pictures for um, different, for, uh, sorry. Uh, endurance sport activities. So people run a marathon and then they want their picture to be posted on Instagram, hopefully as soon as possible. So we started this in 2017 with my partner. Uh, started as the Uber of photography. We wanted photographers to show up at the event and then give us a picture and people could download that. Uh, of course, it didn't work. Uh, we had to uh, change it and talk to the event producers, started a revenue sharing plan and then uh, contract professional photographers uh, so that we could ensure quality about it. Now we're the leaders in Latin America in that step. With October 2019, we were about to break even, and then, of course, shit happens. And uh, we got the social crisis, then we got the pandemic, and no events, nothing. So we had a database. What can we do with that? We started selling the products that people need. So the uh, sneakers and uh, sportwear. And then we said, okay, let's look at the clubs and let's look at the event producers and tailor them. And they, later on we said, okay, we not only do that, but we know how to make events. We've been at so many events, let's bring a high quality event into Latin America, and this is what we're doing with the Challenge franchise. That's the competition for Ironman. How do we go about where to get the clients? Uh, Professor Hax, may he rest in peace, he passed away just uh, recently. Um, he developed the deck the model. We're trying to get into the total customer solution. With that, what we have is to the event producers, we offer them photographs, sportswear, revenue sharing database participants and ticketing. And to our athletes, we offer them the photographs, the sportswear, the challenge and DN, and the tickets. This is what we've done so far. You can see how in 2020 we were about to collapse. But right now uh, we have about $3 million in sales projected for this year with the three business lines, uh, pretty much equal with each of them. And if nothing else, it helps you uh, cover the world looking for photographs in Taiwan, New Zealand, or wherever. So it's, it's fun. <laughs> and what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at a Series A round, pre-Series A round. Uh, what for? We need money to consolidate our presence in Europe and uh, Asia Pacific. I'm currently living in Germany, so that's why I'm heading the pix for you unit. Uh, we need to establish our regional database, uh, sorry, regional presence, and that's the, my partner who's doing that in Latin America, and we need to grow from four to six uh, events in the Andean region. So that's it. We want to create memorable experiences. Thank you. Fantastic, great. great. Let's kick off the questions. Go All ahead. All right, great, uh, great pitch. It's awesome to see second time entrepreneur doing it again. Um, so a couple of questions, right? You're before the A round. So maybe tell the audience if uh, we have some investors among them, how much you're looking to raise and what are the challenges that you see kind of like to scale up to the next milestone? Uh, we're really looking into not that much uh, money. Uh, we're just tired of having to put in our own bootstrapping by the end of the month. So uh, it's really, and the, the idea is to kick it up. Had we stayed in Latin America, we would be a very small, profitable company. Since we want to dream bigger, this is why we're here. So that's the, that's the main goal. That's awesome. That's great. Um, great pitch. I love the story and um, the pivot. Also, I'm there too on, it's impressive to see a second time founder back at it. Um, ask the question in a, a different way, uh, since I know there are so many angel investors in the room or um, investors. If I gave you $500,000 right now, where are you going to go find your customers and what are the next three things you're gonna do? Mm. 
Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> wait. <laughs> there were two questions. <laughs> uh, they want to help. Uh, they are, right now, we have a constraint for uh, the Pix for You is really the cash making machine because we just need to sign up with the um, event producers. Then we have a, sherry, uh, a revenue fee sharing. And as long as the events are okay, then, uh, I mean, a thousand people or more, then it's profitable for them and for us. So that's not a problem. And okay. that we, we really need uh, just to be able to focus on the sales for that side, and it's working pretty fine. We have a, 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 uh, an agreement with Challenge, so that's why I was in uh, Taiwan and New Zealand. I should have been in Korea, but I'm here, so. Uh, another guy is in Korea, and we have an event tomorrow, and another one in Barcelona tomorrow as well. And that's why you create teams, so we can have a good team in place. And uh, regarding the, and so the, the money that we need is really to expand the, the physical side of the business, like the up for you, the up for race and the up for customs, where there you need to, we tried developing this marketplace uh, concept, but it didn't work out. And Latin America is not as advanced as here in the US, and uh, we really need to have inventory. So that's where the money's going. We need to have inventory. And actually the brands, we are uh, the sole distributors for some of the big brands in uh, triathlon, cycling, and uh, running. These are specific niche brands, but we're the sole distributor for Latin America. So they're uh, grilling us that it's a wonderful story that we've had in Chile, but they want to replicate that. Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, that's, that's the idea. Fantastic. Do we have time for another? No? OK, great. Thank you so much. Next up, Marinela from Zuma. So excited to see you again. Welcome, welcome. There you go. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I want to start with a question. Have you ever felt that you can reach your financial goals? I'll go back to you. I'll go back to you. If you haven't, congratulations, you made it in life. <laughs> but <laughs> for you who said yes, and everybody else who said yes, you're not alone. In fact, most people in Latin America, and you could say everywhere else in the world, but in Latin America, have felt the same. Even though more than 80% of people who have an income can save. This problem is even bigger when you look at Latin American women. In fact, less than 1% of them are investing their savings. That compares to more than 60% of women in the United States who do. And although they control, they are 130 million women who control $1.4 trillion, they continue to be overlooked until now. Suma is the first wall tech platform powered by AI technology that guides Latin Americans starting with women through their financial journey. From financial planning to smart investing while rewarding them for taking good financial behaviors. So let me show you how it works real quick. First, with our financial planning tool, people will be able to track their income and expenses automatically by either taking a picture of their um, tickets or by connecting to their bank notifications. Two, they will be able to input their goals and based on those goals, they can understand how much they need to save to, to reach those goals in the time frame that they need. And also, they will have um, they will have access to Sumi. Sumi is on our AI power um, financial expert that will help will help our users identify um, what their financial behavior is and take the best optimal solution for them, as well as recommending them diversified portfolios of local bonds and U.S. equities for them to invest in. 
all this while earning rewards that they can then redeem, similar to your credit card. So like I said, we're starting in Latin America um, with middle class women who can save um, more than $1,000 annually. This is a group that is expected to grow 60% in the next five years. We're launching in Mexico because it's the biggest opportunity in the region and we make money in different ways. And my name is Marinela. I'm one of the I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Suma. We have an amazing team that I can tell you more about it, but I'm running out of time. And <laughs> we have 2,000 active users, and we just launched in four weeks ago. So this is our mission. And if you share our mission, please reach out because I want to talk to you. Thank you. We're not done with you yet. <laughs> Kirsten, sure. I would love to get started. So yes. very exciting to see technology, especially geared towards female spending power, which I like to celebrate all the time. Um, one of the things that I thought about, I was thinking about this, is you have so many different ways to engage with audiences and ways to both um, share insights and rewards. When you think about the types of partnerships that this audience might be able to connect you to, what are the types of places that you think you need connectivity um, in, the, in the financial ecosystem? Can you go back a slide so that folks that want to get the QR code can? Yeah. Got your message. There you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so a few things, right? Our users are people, right? And so we want to be where people are. Right now it's in Latin America. So all of you who are from Latin America, scan the QR code and share it with all your friends because we need users. But more than that, we are doing partnerships with employers so that we can offer this as a benefit for their users, also um, women-led groups in the region, um, student groups as well because they need it, um, and things of this nature. One of our co-founders is a financial um, influencer in Instagram, and as we know, most of our news and most of the people that we now trust is in, are in um, financials in, in Instagram and social media. Um, so if you have any friends who is a financial influencer, we want to talk to them as well, or a sports influencer, travel influencer, whatever it is, um, we also want to talk to them. Super. Kevin, Thank you. Good. Oh, sure. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm still on. <laughs> So my question is somewhat related to that. I'm curious to know, how did you acquire those 2,000 customers? That might inspire some more ideas in addition to partnerships to get you some more customers. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so like I said, my co-founder is a financial influencer. Um, more than 12,000 people follow her. So most of the, our power users um, really trust her, so came from, uh, from them. But also we've been doing a lot of events. Um, we've been already partnership, partnering with some of these uh, groups, as well as we've been doing, we've been also featuring a lot of PR stuff and things of this nature. So it has been a lot of uh, word of mouth and things of that nature. But we're also looking for other ways to expand, and that's essentially why we're here. Thank you. Okay. Quick question. Yeah, sneaking one, one uh, last comment. Uh, one of my classmates is uh, Miles Wellesley, that was uh, the early one of the early employees at Robin Hood, and I think you oh. guys should definitely speak. Yes. They can help you a lot uh, to figure out the early stages. Yeah. If you know anyone of Wellfront, Betterman, Robin Hood, <laughs> Stash, <laughs> Elvest, yeah. come talk to me. Awesome. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Daniel from Milco. Yay! Hi, everyone. One of the privileges at being at MIT was always, for me, exposing and presenting to your classmates and now other classes. I've seen my friends presenting at the YARN or at the 100K competition, so I'm very happy about the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you all for coming. What if I told you there is a way for restaurants to maximize their potential without worrying about demand generation? 60% of restaurants fail within the first year of operation. That is because they haven't adjusted to the rapid changes in consumer behavior. According to UBS report 
by 2030, 40% of all restaurant revenues will come from online channels. Even restaurants that are trying to adjust to these changes find themselves struggling to create online demand for their businesses. Milko let restaurants focus on cooking, creating online demand for their businesses and helping them reach their full potential. How do we do that? We do that by matching them with digital brands who has massive demand but no supply and wants to capitalize on their demand by offering a digital restaurant. Our technology and platform makes it possible and easy. From creating a storefront to running the day-to-day -day operations all the way to providing insight and drive performance, both for the restaurants and the digital restaurants. Restaurants on our platform expect to increase profits by up to 40% in their first year alone with Milko. We are already working with hundreds of restaurants across the Northeast, and I invite you all to help us to continue bringing this vision to life to create a world where restaurants focus on their passion and where diners discover the ultimate culinary experiences. Thank you. Well done. Stay up here. Stay up here. Great. Okay. Daniel, great, Kick us uh, great pitch, yes. Uh, I was sort of not allowed to grill Daniel. I know him uh, for many years. And I've been tracking his company. He's an amazing entrepreneur and amazing story. Um, maybe just for the audience, I know that you're working in the Northeast. I know we talked a, lot, a little bit about even like expanding from the Northeast uh, nationally and internationally. Can you talk a little bit about the plans for expansion of Milko? So first of all, if um, any of you want to help us expand globally, if you're coming from a country and know anyone, any operator, anyone in the restaurants, would love to connect. Uh, yeah, we're, we're at the Northeast and actually one of the things that we are strategizing and thinking about is which model to use in order to expand. Currently in the Northeast, we're doing a GM model, very famously where you take one person to manage the PNL, take all of our learnings, take all of our technology and the playbook, build the market and then monitor that market while headquarters are providing tools on operations, technology, marketing and so on. Um, in terms of international expansion, uh, we're open to people that have done it before to advice. And we are in between also kind of that GM model, not this year, not next year, or even doing licensing. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Daniel, great pitch. Um, great to see you again. And love that you are um, uh, allowing the restaurant to follow their passion and double down on their strengths. Can you share a little more about the brands and how you pursue those brands and the ones that you're looking to connect with since so many of us are at various organizations around the world? So for me, the ultimate brands are people, organization, restaurants that have some follower base. It could be on Instagram. It could be that you're a famous chef. It could be that you're just a person that has something to share. That people can connect with your values and your vision through culinary experiences, and specifically for us, Milko, on-demand food delivery. Go ahead. We would love to connect with brands as well. So if any of you know, heard, or have your own brands, um, talk to me. We have time for a few more questions, though. So. Yes, uh, great job. I'd like to know what intellectual property do you have? In other words, what's your competitive advantage? What sets you apart from the Me Too's that might be lurking? Um, it took us three years to build this technology. I launched a company in 2019, and I actually started with my own brand to even prove that a digital brand with no brick and mortar, no location, can actually connect and have customers that are coming back again and again. 
I had my own first location before doing it in a distributed way and kind of sharing that growth with existing restaurant. So it's anything from our strong um, data that has now seen tens of thousands of orders all the way to API integrations to multiple platforms running it on a single tablet, dispatching couriers, as well as doing management of inventory. To answer on kind of a com competitive advantage, it's a marketplace. There is kind of a lot of uh, flywheel as you get more brands and more restaurants, both in terms of the data sets as well in terms of kind of empowering channels, other companies that are taking you to the customer, connecting you to the inventory management. Mm -hmm. um, takes time to build. Uh, we do have uh, two patents in terms of the matching, and kind of uh, we want to continue building that and increase that network. Great, thanks. Great. Bringing up our last entrepreneur to round us out, Elise from AeroShield. Welcome, welcome. You all are going to spend 80% of your life inside of a building. Windows become a really important element of making sure that we're happy, comfortable, and productive. But it turns out that they come with a pretty big price tag. And in fact, for the homes here in the US, $40 billion in energy is lost through our windows every year. That's a pretty big barrier to reaching a net zero built environment for us here in the US. But I do have good news, and that's that AeroShield manufactures a material known as a silica aerogel they can cut these energy losses in half. So my name is Elise Strobach, and I'm the CEO, co-founder, and inventor of this silica aerogel material that was actually invented here in the mechanical engineering department as part of my PhD. And what's unique about this material is it's one of the most insulating in the world. And we actually patented a nanostructure that allows this material inside of this window to be more insulating than the air in this room and more transparent than the glass that normally goes inside your window. So this is pretty exciting because in the past three years, we've been able to take this technology out of the lab and actually develop a manufacturing process that can make large sheets that are allowing us for the first time to test these actual windows that can save 65% more thermal energy than anything that's on the market today. And that's pretty exciting because in less than five years for you as a homeowner, that window could be paying back and saving hundreds to thousands of dollars. This is also really exciting because we've been working on this for the past three years, and last year we just closed a $4 million seed round so that we can set up a pilot line here in Massachusetts. Ooh, that's yeah. Great. <laughs> yep. It's been really exciting actually developing um, and testing some of these first units, growing the team to 17, and actually be looking at, at making these first prototypes and getting ready for a beachhead market, a $400 million opportunity with an entry point in entry doors that then leads to the larger market for windows and doors, a $3 billion opportunity for AeroShield, but more importantly, it represents more than half a gigaton that we could be saving every year. That's just the starting point. The longer that we're able to manufacture and bring more passionate people who care about sustainability and about fixing this built environment problem from the outside in so that we can have a fundamentally different experience and have it be sustainable. So very excited to be here today to share the progress that we're working on, products coming, and if this speaks to you, if you get excited about hard tech innovation, space age materials, aerogels are actually developed by NASA almost 100 years ago, if you're into manufacturing, if you want to go sell to big window manufacturing customers, then please come talk to me. We'd love to share why we feel that AeroShield is the clear choice for window insulation. Thank you. Wonderful. Amazing. Congrats. Thank you. Wow. Congrats. Uh, okay. I, I was going to kick this one off because as a Texan, I'm very, very excited about this technology. We need it. We need it now. Mm -hmm. um, at least that was a wonderful pitch, super polished, and such amazing progress so far. Uh, the question I have is hardware, hardware is a hard business, and it's pretty capital intensive. As you think about both the types of fundraising that you'll be looking for and maybe strategic partnerships, what are the two to three things that this group of folks can do to make introductions for you? Yeah, no, it's a great point. So the industry is, uh, window manufacturing is pretty consolidated. So in terms of the number of strategic investors, you might think it's pretty finite. And I did mention that, you know, windows and doors are this first target market. 
but fundamentally we're a platform material. So we get pretty excited when you actually look at the definition of window, it can be pretty broad. So when we think about strategic investors, we really are looking to understand and to learn about potential follow-on markets mm. really early on because sometimes it can lead us to building different things into our manufacturing process, maybe adjusting our targets just a little bit so we might be able to come back and serve those markets. So pretty much anybody that needs clarity and insulation, we'd love to chat and we'd love to learn more. And in terms of the regular investment path, we're really interested in mission-aligned investors. So in particular, right now, we have a really great seed round that uh, includes some quasi-governmental, so mass CSC, mass ventures, and also some philanthropic investors. And so if that feels like it really resonates with you, if you really want to be a part of this mission where we're driving big impact with a good fundamental business model, but we're willing to really go after that big impact and push really hard, then would love to talk and, and love to see if there's a way to have you be involved with part of our team. I only have one other question before I would ask my other esteemed panelists, and it's what do you think your biggest challenge is in the next 12 months? Yeah, I would say in that next 12 months, it's really understanding that fine dance with hard tech in terms of knowing what we need to build for a production facility and really seeking to get these materials out there in a building, surviving through all of those cycles that they need to. Um, so balancing, making sure we know what we're building. We don't want to build in inefficiencies. We know that part of our mission is that impact. We want to make this as affordable as possible. And so we want to make sure that that material, the manufacturing, the sustainability, all of those things that we've really done our due diligence and that we really understand the fundamentals, but are still driving to get that product out there and get those learnings and get that actual impact. Other questions from the uh, yeah. I'd like to know, you said that you've raised $4 million and you've been in this for about three years. How much money do you need now to get to that next milestone? Yeah, so uh, good news, bad news is that actually the next set of milestones, which for us is to be able to make and test a prototype to those customer standards, mm -hmm. we're actually going to be able to do that under what we raised in that seed round. So between that and getting some really good grants, both from some state-backed entities, but also like Department of Energy, for example, has kind of helped us get to that milestone. But to your point is we're actually looking at that and looking at the climate numbers and just read an article about how we're going to pass that critical 1.5 uh, temperature threshold very likely for the first time, not permanently, but for the first time before 2027, that really hits me hard of like, we don't have time to wait. So we're thinking about how, if we could raise a little bit more money, if we do have strategic partners, if we do have somebody who's willing to co-invest in the kind of equipment and work with us to get a first product into market, how can we go faster? And I think what we're looking at now is we could buy equipment that we know is gonna work for us, that we know how to build it. It's not the full line, but we can buy that equipment early and eat up that long lead time, especially post COVID, we've seen a lot of supply chain things. And so we're thinking, how do you get that sequence? How do you get that piece of equipment in, learning from it, creating traction with customers sooner? So that just means that we can build production sooner. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, um, Elise, so I'm sitting here as one who's about to replace all the windows in my home. Um, wondering on this message of going faster, um, is there a potential for uh, bringing on any members of your team or any partners that could help move faster? I think of um, so many of us who were thinking about sort of rebates on energy efficiency, um, and the, the three-year timeline, I love the, like, the caution. Um, and I'm wondering of who could help you move faster. If there was a strategic hire, um, a partner, someone that someone in this room might know and save me some money, I'll be a prototype. Like, who could help you go faster? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, so, you know, one piece is we obviously, as we get into this transition of, of wanting to cross that chasm of, yeah. you know, coming from these small prototypes to a first product, I think a big one is the unknown unknowns. And right now in this product, manufacturing and delivery and integration with a customer and all the pieces around quality and the choices that we're making on what do you prove first and what do you not prove? What do you save until you've kind of got a product in the market? I think somebody with that kind of experience could really help us avoid a lot of mistakes, really help us learn quicker, and maybe even be a little bit creative in this industry. One of the symptoms of the built environment is there hasn't been a lot of innovation, and sometimes it's just we get very excited about the innovation, but we don't necessarily have that skill of being able to explain to the customer why that innovation is going to be a good thing, even if it comes with a little disruption first. So I think somebody who's had that experience, especially with that hard tech bend, would be hugely beneficial for us. Fabulous. 
Great. Any people from the engine? Well, Bar, we did it again. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. If you'll allow me, I'm gonna wrap up with a quick story. So when I was in Sloan, I built my company uh, get rid here at the Trust Center. And when I say build it, it means that you know, it developed from a pitch competition to a sandbox application, and slowly and slowly it, it was created. I actually built it in the center. Like we had inventory underneath and we used the, the elevator that you're not supposed to use to ship stuff. It was really built here. And when it came to uh, Bill and the other team in the end of the session after our last board meeting in Delta Bean, we we're like, we're not gonna do it we're gonna close the company and we're gonna go to our corporate jobs because we just cannot take the risk. They said, great, go find bigger problem. And that's, that's the beauty of MIT and the Trust Center, right? We build, we learn, we learn based on what we build, but, but the, the intention here is educational. We build people. Um, and I did, by the way, six weeks later, went and found a bigger problem. And today, by the way, in Polylabs, we are pioneering a new mechanism to accelerate the speed of development in the area of humanitarian release. So basically we're looking at existing technology and we're repurposing them to solve huge problems in humanitarian distribution. So we make sure that people get what they need faster and more effectively when a disaster hits, for example. This is what MIT is all about. We take and we think, and back to the mission, we think about how are we improving the world using these innovation. So I wanna thank everyone who's here in the room, who's here on the panel, who is here just pitched for being part of this incredible ecosystem and entrepreneurial um, adventure. What a great way to wrap up the reunion and really, really appreciate your time. Jenny, where are we going from here? C function! <laughs> Thank you again, and if you are interested in staying engaged and supporting up and coming entrepreneurs, please reach out to the Trust Center. Uh, we can't wait to engage with you more. Have a great rest of the reunion, guys. Woo